Hey everyone, this is Paul from Thinking Christian, and in this video what I'm going to do is explain Aquinas' first way, or his sort of argument from motion. We'll be talking about Aquinas' five, you know, proofs of God that he talks about in the Summa. I say proofs in quotes because what Aquinas means by proofs are basically just arguments. In fact, Aquinas himself, if you read the Summa, didn't necessarily think God's existence was self-evident to us per se. He, of course, thought God existed, but he didn't think that we necessarily would grasp this intuitively all the time, which is why perhaps some of these arguments were needed. Uh, very interesting. I, I have a kind of a confession to make. First of all, I had assumed without reading Aquinas that his kind of five ways were these proto arguments that had been debunked or had all these problems. I do not think that way anymore. Um, I also started reading the Summa and it is very good. The, the layout is really cool. Basically, it's basically this like basically an encyclopedia of like questions and he read the question and he writes basically several objections to the question. Then he says, this is what I say. He gives his explanation. Then he addresses all the objections and each one is done in just a couple of pages. And he just, he does this hundreds of times. He has different books. It's a massive, massive book, but he tries to address each one. It's very, very interesting. Uh, very worth the read. I really in, am enjoying reading it, even though I am not that far. Um, I like, there's a version I found on iBooks for like $2. You can find it for free as well, but the $2 one has better formatting. So I don't mind paying the $2 because I've certainly gotten my $2 worth. But anyway, let's go ahead and get started. So basically this argument is called the argument from motion, but what Aquinas is referring to by motion is just basically change. He's kind of following Aristotle to talk about change. It just so happens that motion is the most obvious example of change that we can think of. And if you think about it, really motion is just change through space and time. I mean, what other, what else is motion than just sort of change according to as, you know, you can have movement through time where, where position stays the same, but you can also have movement through space over time, which is what we're usually used to. So movement being change, but, but you could imagine this argument applying to change more directly. And one of the things that's really interesting when you look at this argument, and I'll present it in my way first because I got a little confused. It took me a while to work it through, and then I'll present Aquinas' way, is the way that Newton's laws of motion, in particular his first law of motion, was inspired by this argument. If you're somebody like me who had to take a lot of physics and mathematics, but specifically physics, it's very clear where Newton got his ideas from. Uh, this argument is over probably around 800 years old or so, so predates Newton, and um, I'm sure Newton was very familiar with it at the time. Now, this has to do with the distinction in this argument between what we call potential versus actual movement. And if you're going along the physics route, think of potential movement in terms of potential energy and actual movement as kinetic energy. And this is a really helpful distinction because, you know, if you lift a really heavy weight to the top of a hill, it has potential energy. And then when you release it, it that basically turns the potential energy into actual kinetic energy. You kind of have this this difference here. So things either have the potential to move or are actually moving. So this is where this distinction can be kind of helpful. We'll talk a little bit more. So one of the things that Aquinas is going to argue is that you need some sort of external force. This is, you know, Newtonian type of language to cause things to change from the potential to move to an actual movement. Now, this external force doesn't need to be a, a physical motion. It could be sort of an act of mind, but it needs some sort of external thing and some sort of external thing that is already in a state of actuality to cause other things to go from potential to actual movement. So with that out of the way, let me explain my version of the argument that I think it makes it a little bit more clear, and then I'll talk about Aquinas' original version. So my formulation goes like this. Premise one, things that move either have the potential to move or are actually moving. They are a actual move. So this is the distinction between potential and actuality. Things cannot both have the potential to move and be actually moving. If they're actually moving, they have sort of realized their potential. That's the important distinction here. Premise two says external actual motion is required for to bring something from the potential movement to an actual movement. So this is Newton's first law, right? An object at rest will stay at rest until acted upon by an unbalanced force. This is kind of that particular idea that something that's in a state of potentiality, there needs to be something that's already actually moving to cause something that has the potential to move to go from potentially moving to actually moving. Premise th three, things actually move. We observe things that are in a state of actual movement. Premise four says there cannot be an infinite regress of past movement, and this is where Aquinas is going to cite Aristotle. Maybe he would cite Al-Ghazali, some of the absurdities related to infinity. I don't even think this argument necessarily rests on this premise, but this is the way Aquinas would say it, so he, he will say it this way. And then the conclusion is there must be a first mover or an unmoved mover which causes movement itself. And this is literally what Aquinas is saying. This is just God. This is, this is God, how he's going to define God, and this 
um, the point that was not lost on Aquinas is this is God who introduces himself in the Bible to Moses as I am, as sort of existence itself or sort of actuality itself with no potential. So think about this as an analogy because it can be kind of hard to understand. Imagine like a line of dominoes or a series of dominoes arranged in a line. Dominoes cannot cause themselves to fall over. They don't, they don't just fall over for no reason. If they fall, they were either hit by another domino in the chain or by a person who basically poked the first domino, which caused all the rest of the dominoes to fall. And here's where you can even go beyond Aquinas' argument and say, even if you argue the dominoes are arranged in an infinite line, this doesn't explain why any of the dominoes fall in the first place. In fact, I have a real issue with philosophers appealing to infinity without rigorously looking at the way mathematical analysts like Rudin have tried to define infinity. Often they're like, oh, well, the reason that this domino falls is because there was one before it. And why does that one fall? Because there's one before that. But it, just claiming there's an infinite number of dominoes doesn't explain why any of them fall at all. In fact, you can make this point by just saying you can imagine there being, if you believe in the existence of actual infinities, which I don't, but if you do, you can imagine an infinite line of dominoes that where none of them fall. They just kind of all are. So the fact that they're in an infinite line or they're in an arrangement does not explain why any of the dominoes fall in the first place. So the question with this argument is why do any dominoes fall? And we, of course, observe dominoes fall. So in the context of this, if we observe any dominoes falling, whoever pressed that first domino that then caused the other ones down the chain to move would be the sort of prime mover or the one who knocked over the first dominoes. All the dominoes have the potential to fall, but they don't fall until I act, causing the first one, which then causes this chain reaction. So even though you can say domino n plus 1 was caused by domino n, there had to have been a first domino that needed to be set in motion before all the other ones down the chain could. So each one can be explained by the previous one, except for the first one. The first one needs an actual action to go from its state of potentiality to actuality. So a few pieces I want to mention. So first of all, when we talk about God, we are talking about something that's pure actuality. And as a necessary being just has no potential. God just is. God doesn't have any potential not to be or not to act or be the way that he is. And as a result, some would say God is pure act or God is pure actuality. And if you consider Leibniz's modal metaphysics, Leibniz, once again, also being familiar with Aquinas, you have this idea of the idea that some things must be while other things might have been. So Leibniz is probably just in some ways expanding or commenting on this argument. This idea of potentiality is involving states that could be or could not be, um, whereas actuality is what actually is. So, yeah, that's the way I like to think of it. Potential is what might be, and actuality is what is, and you need some external force or external cause to cause something to realize which possibility of potential that you're going to realize. Um, and Aquinas' argument, once again, is that potentials cannot self-actualize. Things cannot create themselves. You must have something that causes something to realize which of its possible states it must actually be in. Or if it's already in a state, this is once again the argument for motion, why does it go from its current state into a different state? Well, this is where Aquinas would say there needs to be some sort of external cause. One example here of this sort of potential actual distinction is consider a coin. A coin that's sitting there, if I was to flip it, has the potential to be heads or tails. However, when I actually flip it, me causing the actuality of this coin, it the coin ends up getting a state, an actual state of heads or tails. So basically, it's like until I act on the coin, until I actually flip it, I recognize that this coin could land as heads or tails. So there needs to be an external action or an external force applied to cause it to realize a state of actuality. This is what Aquinas would say. And Aquinas, once again, this whole point here of God introducing himself as I am, as existence or actuality itself, um, Aquinas himself even cites that. It was really cool for me to read this because I kind of come to this realization too. And, you know, obviously this point was not lost on Aquinas. Now, this is the way that Aquinas words his argument. This is a little bit more formal. And he goes like this. Premise one, things move. And motion, motion is sort of the most obvious form of change. Premise two, change is passing from potency to act, which is from potentiality to actuality. Premise three, nothing passes from potency to act or potentiality to actuality except by something that is already in act, for it is impossible for a potency to actualize itself. Once again, this is the idea. Things don't cause themselves to change. A domino doesn't cause itself to fall. Um, it needs to be caused by something externally that's already in a state of actuality. Premise four, there can't be an infinite regress of actualizers or movers. Basically, the idea of if there's no first mover, then there cannot be any subsequent motion since all subsequent motion depends on prior movers for its motion until you get back to whatever is the sort of initial actuality. 
Um, so then the conclusion that Aquinas comes to is therefore there must be an unmoved mover or a first unmoved over, a pure act or actualizer with no potentiality. It is just actuality itself in some ways you could say. And then of course, therefore God exists, God being defined as the first mover. This is what Aquinas would say. So anyway, thanks for watching. This is Aquinas's argument from motion. Let me know what you think. What's really interesting is connecting this to sort of Leibniz's arguments and understanding these idea of contingency, but uh, it's a really interesting argument. I think it's a really good argument and yeah, I, I just never really understood it, but now I kind of understand it and hopefully I can share that with you. Anyway, have a good one.